what this is all about, is your right to freedom of speech. What made America great is an independent, vigorous press. If a jerk burns a flag, America is not threatened. Political speech is the heart of the First Amendment. We're expressing their religious beliefs. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all the God's children. Welcome to Speaking Freely, a weekly conversation about the First Amendment, the arts, and American culture. I'm Ken Paulson, Executive Director of the First Amendment Center. Holly Hughes is a widely respected performance artist who is known both for her thoughtful work and as a member of the NEA4. Her fight for free expression took her all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. She's here today to share her thoughts about that battle and about free expression in America. Welcome, Holly. Thank you, Ken. Now, a membership in the NEA4, that's not exactly like joining the Kiwanis Club, is it? No, it's not. Uh, it, it, it was kind of an honor, a dishonor, uh, uh, sort of uh, imposed on us uh, by the National Council on the Arts when they took away our funding that had been recommended. It's, it sort of sounds like a bad band, you know, <laughs> that, um, or, or we were later referred to as Karen Finley, the three homosexuals, which sounds like a really bad <laughs> really band. Does. I've seen them play, as a matter of fact. Um, and, and yet this has been a, a battle. Um, your status as a member of the NEA4 has been a decade long, really. Yes, it all started in, in 1990 when uh, the four of us were recommended for funding by peer pa uh, panels in the NEA. And then uh, under political pressure, uh, John Fraunmeier was then chairman, took away our grants. And it was during a whole sort of public debate about controversial funding for the arts. and. Um, we decided to sue the government. Um, we felt that this was clearly an abridgment of free speech, and um, it wasn't something that we felt hopeful about changing in Congress since they had given us this horrible law. So that's when our battle started. Oh, what was it about your work that was deemed dangerous? Well, uh, there was a one-sentence description of my work before the National Council voted to take away my funding. Now, they never saw the work. They never read it. What they talked about is my um, identity as a lesbian. They said, Holly Hughes is a lesbian, and her work is very heavily of that genre. <laughs> And, you know, I can't really disagree with that. I mean, <laughs> I am a lesbian. My work is about that. I just didn't realize it was a genre. And maybe I want my own category of funding, like <laughs> landscape painting or macrame uh, plant hangers or something like that. But it was really about um, targeted homophobia. And uh, it, it, although, as I say that, I feel like I hope Jesse Helms would not like my work. Then I'd really have to commit suicide. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, it is controversial and it is provocative, and I think that should have a place in a country that pretends to be a democracy. Even at the time of, of the controversy, homoerotic work was, was one of, among the works banned, right? That language was used? Yes. Uh, in uh, 89, I believe, there was a statute uh, passed that said the NEA couldn't fund work that could be considered obscene, and they gave you like a checklist in case you didn't know what that meant. And, and uh, homoeroticism was on the checklist. So uh, they went after artists in this medium that were openly gay. When you put together this, this band mm -hmm, you referred to, mm -hmm, the NEA4, mm -hmm. was that an accidental coming together, or did someone in, in uh, the arts movement say, look, we need four people who represent a wide range of work or, or a targeted range of work? I mean, how much of that was strategy and how much of it was accident? If it was strategy, it was on the part of the right wing in targeting the four of us. But we did make a decision um, to work together in our lawsuits, which was um, considering the fact that we're all individual artists, and artists tend to be very strong individualists, the fact that we were able to work together. It's, 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 organizing artists is like herding cats. And so we did work together on this lawsuit. So how much money was at stake in your grant? Uh, each of the artists were awarded grants that were between six and eight thousand dollars. So the whole argument that this was about taxpayer waste um, is is totally specious. Uh, the, the government spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to prevent um, three homos and one feminist from getting twenty four thousand dollars in hard earned tax money. So it, it was a really small amount, but that amount of money 
goes a long way in defraying some of the costs in, in making the pieces that we make. Can you talk a little bit about, about your work mm -hmm. as a performance artist and, and where does the $6,000 go into that process? Does that fund your entire project or is that just beginning the process? Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. Um, well, I, uh, even though it's a solo piece, I always work with other people. I work with, in, in this work that I'm doing now, Preaching the Perverted, I worked with Lois Weaver. Uh, as a director and a collaborator, and so some of the money would go to pay uh, her a fee, and then um, I often produce myself. So you know, at uh, Performance Space 122, you know, you hire the lighting designer, you rent the rehearsal space, um, you know, the various props. So it 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 doesn't completely pay for the project, but um, it helps pay for some of the costs of of, of making a piece of of art, even if it seems very simple and low-tech like my work is because I want it to be accessible, there's still other people involved and I feel like artists aren't, aren't um, air-breathing plants right. <laughs> that we should get paid for work. But as you point out, even if it's six to $8,000, which is not a great amount of money, mm -hmm. it, it might be a make or break for you in some cases or for some artists, wouldn't it? A absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, a lot of the artists, particularly in the field that I work in, performance art, which is kind of the garage band uh, uh, arena of theater, um, uh, a lot of the people are coming from communities that are already disadvantaged. There's a lot of people of color, there's a lot of gay people, um, and these are people that don't have access to, you know, other kind of funding. They're not likely to get commissioned by, um, you know, some some big cultural institution to make their work. And it does. It it, it, may, it, it makes it possible for a lot of people who wouldn't have access to art making to have access to it. We want to talk some more about the battle itself and, mm -hmm. the, and the path through the courts. But but if you answer this question, why in the world does it make sense for somebody who's working in Rockford, Illinois? have some money taking his paycheck uh, to fund your work. Why not, why not keep government out of the arts? Well, w one of the things is, uh, um, yeah, this is one of the arguments that people would often say, you know, if a majority of people in this country didn't like your work, why should they have to pay for it? Well, of course, a majority of people haven't seen my work. But this really goes to the, the question of, a, a couple of key questions about what is the role of minorities and minority expression in a, in a majority rule system that we supposedly have. Uh, does, this, does this mean that minorities have no rights, um, you know, uh, and, and uh, do we have no access to speaking? And it also goes to the question, I think this whole arts question is about a broader question about public funding in general. And right now in the last you know, 20 years, uh, can it be 20 years since Reagan was elected? Oh, shoot me. Uh, but there's been this whole battle to um, eliminate all kinds of public funding. Not public funding for the arts alone, but housing, education, health care, all of these things. Government out of this. And um, the government has become something that takes care of corporate interests and the interests of wealthy individuals. And so I feel... Um, I really think that it's the government's role in a democracy to provide access to arts, education, housing, all of these things together for people even if they don't have means. Mm -hmm. And you know, the day comes when I get a menu with my tax form about I get to reallocate the money where I want to go, you know? I mean, it's like, since when do you get a choice in where you're funding, you know, direct deposit my amount of, uh, my contribution to Trent Lott's, you know, <laughs> salary, if that is the case. I mean, I have a feeling that if people actually got this menu and got to reallocate it, that there would be more money going to the arts and less to expensive toilets at the Pentagon or like failed Mars expeditions. Have you, uh, had, did you have any idea what you were getting into? Did you know that there was going to be a decade-long battle, or do you think you'd be in and out of this fairly quickly, take your $6,000 and go home? I really didn't have, uh, I knew that getting involved in a, in a lawsuit against the federal government was going to be involving, but I had no idea that it was going to go on for as long, um, that it would also implicate other people, for example, that places that would present me would get death threats and lose funding and people would lose their jobs, and that it would go on for 10 years. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Now, in the course of those 10 years, uh, in addition to having a member of the NEA4 attached to your name at every reference, mm -hmm. 
um, uh, you won a couple of important court battles mm -hmm. and, uh, and in fact did get your grant. Was that part of a settlement? Uh, in 1993, the Clinton administration did settle on the part of our lawsuit that was about our grants. They gave us our grants and they admitted in, in that settlement that they had violated the NEA's own policies uh, in, in denying us the money initially. Uh, and two lower courts decided that, yes, these res uh, restrictions, first the obscenity and then the decency language, were obviously unconstitutional. Um, and that was a that was very uh, reassuring decision. But why the Clinton administration, why, why did you do this to us, Bill? Why you... Um, why he had to appeal this to the Supreme Court, and this Supreme Court is, is uh, you know, I don't know, it's for the Psychic Friends Network. <laughs> it's really out of my bailiwick to say why he did this. Well, the, the case did, in fact, go to the Supreme Court uh, to resolve really one issue, and, and it had to do with language in the enabling legislation, that, uh, in the funding legislation that said the NEA should take into account standards of decency. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an advisory mm -hmm. uh, piece of guidance from Congress. And then the Supreme Court had to decide whether that was an infringement on the First Amendment right. of the Constitution. Right. Right. And the Supreme Court decided? Well, the Supreme Court decided. Actually, it was they decided because the, the statute read they may take into consideration. May. They could. But they didn't have to. General standards of decency. That that was um, constitutional. And that if the Supreme Court, or if, if, if um, they were required to take into consideration, that that would be unconstitutional. And so there was some measure of a victory for our side, because we had argued that the First Amendment clearly prohibited um, distribu distribution of funds that discriminated against unpopular viewpoints, like the lesbian viewpoint. Um, and they agreed with that. But they said, because it wasn't a requirement, but it was just a serving suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> and then they went on to say, in this really sort of gaslight fashion, that there had been no discrimination against the NEA4, you know, despite the fact that the whole transcript showed that it had been clearly based on, you know, um, our political viewpoints and our identity that we were we were denied these grants. But of course, the, I, one of the things that was so appalling is that the Supreme Court justices didn't appear to have read the briefs, so their judgments weren't prejudiced by actual um, uh, familiarity with the facts. So, you were sitting in the Supreme Court when yes. I heard the oral arguments. Yes. As a performer, it had to be tempting to get up and and share some thoughts of your own with them. Uh, <laughs> How did you find that environment? Uh, it felt a lot like um, a sort of a giant detention hall. <laughs> um, it, it felt like kind of a national timeout, like that you're taken in there um, an hour before the Supreme Court convenes. There's nothing going on there. You're escorted to your seats by members of the Secret Service who yell at you. <laughs> they seat you in pews. Your feet don't touch the ground. And you can't, you can't read the paper. You can't talk. You just sit there for an hour waiting until Daddy gets home. And then the journalists are, um, I mean, I think maybe Nina Totenberg gets a better seat in the house, but um, I knew people that were covering it. They are actually seated behind a curtain. It's some sort of, like, orthodox approach. I mean, I think these are people who really don't like reviews. So it was an amazing piece of theater. You're sitting in these very uncomfortable pews, um, ready to, you know, be turned to a hymnal, page 214. And the justices are way, way up there in these big <laughs> black leather chairs that swivel and rock. And um, so it was an amazing performance. As a performer, I was just sort of taking in the stagecraft and thinking, what does this mean? I have to ask, did the Supreme Court yell at, I mean, did the Secret <laughs> Service yell at everyone or was it just you? Were, were, <laughs> were you the problem? <laughs> I was not the specific problem child, although they, they sort of, it was sort of a general um, dressing down that started before the justices got in. Uh, the, some um, burly guy got up there and said, here's the deal. You respect us and we'll respect you. And he, he barked out the rules of the court. And then they stand at the end of your pews. And, you know, um, I was, I was like twisting around in my seat and they were sort of, I felt like at any moment I'm going to get thrown out. Um, but it was, it was, it was definitely directed towards 
we the people in right. general. Early in the, uh, the battle, the court battle, uh, I've read somewhere that you were told not to talk about gay bashing, that there are certain things that your lawyers advised you against making the case for. Is that? Right. It, it was less from our lawyers, but uh, one of the things that was so disturbing in this battle uh, was that a lot of the people who were arguing for funding for the NEA really wanted to talk about in the most bland First Amendment terms and, you know, uh, not specifically talk about the work that was under attack. And the work that was under attack from Serrano to Marilyn Riggs to my work and lots of other people is provocative work. It is, it, it, it's intentionally designed to raise questions, and a lot of times it was questions about sexuality and sexual identity, maybe it was about the American flag, maybe it was about use of Christian symbols, and the left didn't make a good case for why, why work that raises uncomfortable questions should be funded. It's not a soundbite argument you can make. And actually, I think a lot of people on the left were uncomfortable. I mean, some of the people would say stuff like, well, there's been a few mistakes, and you're sitting there, and they would name you, and you're, <laughs> you're just like, oh, no, with friends like this. But really, most of the money goes for blonde children in Iowa doing finger painting and ancestor worship at major cultural <laughs> institutions, and we don't have a lot of these, you know, homos running around uh, grass or... Uh, finger painting can yeah. be provocative in its own right, I, I think. <laughs> it can be. Is there art that so deeply offends you that you would um, that you would cut it off? How do you feel about um, some of the rap music, people like Eminem, uh, others who are accused of being of being gay bashers themselves in art? Well, there's I mean, there's a lot of you know one of the assumptions that they make is is a progressive person is that you're not offended by anything, and in fact, I am offended all the time. Um, for, forget about rap music and all of it. Think about I think about David Mamet. <laughs> One of the most produced contemporary playwrights in America, who I think is a very talented person with Tourette syndrome, um, <laughs> and, you know. But I also feel like I, I want. I, I feel like dissent and controversy is essential to a democracy. So yes, do I have problems with work that's funded? Often. I have problems with most of mainstream culture, and <laughs> this is what only a ten-hour show, so we can just go over the. We could just do a, a, a lightning strike of them, but I feel like we should have um, a diversity of opinions out there. And you would not be in favor of government funding popular culture things that already have market appeal. And the NEA was set up to fund work that wasn't going to be necessarily funded by the marketplace. And this recognition that there is a lot of culture that um, isn't going to reach a mass audience and that that's an important part of, of um, you know, our heritage. And also it makes, you know, a lot of pop popular culture events are not accessible to, you know, working class, poor people, even middle class. I mean, think about like, I would have loved to see the Barbara Streisand <laughs> concert, but it was a little beyond my means. And public funding meant that a lot of people who weren't privileged had access. It kept ticket prices down and sometimes free. So it made art accessible to a lot of people who are cut out of the marketplace. You mentioned your Supreme Court experience as being theater, mm -hmm. and, and that theater inspired new theater. Mm -hmm. You've got a new show called Preaching to the Perverted. Is, is that truth in advertising? <laughs> yes, I just, I wanted everyone to feel included, um, you know, and, and to not, I mean, sometimes they think, oh, it's a lesbian performance artist, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a lesbian, uh, so I'm not going to feel included. So I just pronounce everyone a, um, sometimes I'll, I'll start out the evening by pronouncing everybody a lesbian for the evening and passing out membership cards. It's just one evening of lesbianism that's completely, <laughs> you know, everything's free. If you want to sign up for the weekend, it's more expensive. But it is about, it is about including the audience and saying this isn't just my story, but this is something that's happened to all of us. And uh, I understand, as hard as, as this from, is for me to believe, that people have actually walked out offended and said we want our money back. What did they think they were walking into? Um. 
who knows? I mean, I did the show uh, in uh, Baltimore at a wonderful place, the Baltimore Theater Project, and after the reviews had come out, uh, there were there were walkouts, and uh, people people said, you know, we want our money back, and, and and the box office manager was like, you're the one who came to preaching to the perverted. That's right. <laughs> what did you think? Uh, they thought it was a musical. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> are you ever tempted from the stage to to say, hold on, where are you going? No, and I know certain artists, like Karen Finley, does often confront people who walk out and, and has some sort of discussion with them. I feel like it's people's right to leave. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's yeah. their right to it's leave. I'm more, I'm more upset about the narcoleptics that sit in the front <laughs> row. <laughs> the people who seem to, um, sometimes I suspect that it's a condition of their parole. It was like either... <laughs> 90 days in jail or performance art. <laughs> uh, and, and it's got to undermine your confidence as somebody who intends to provoke, to have somebody actually pass out in the, in the front row. <laughs> Talk a little bit about bringing this piece together. I understand there's, a, there's a, a, a classic moment where you actually introduce the audience to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, symbolically anyway. Can you talk a little bit about how you do that? Well, one of, the, one of the motivations I had in making this piece was outing the Supreme Court, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and by that I mean it's a hugely important part of our government, but it's invisible. There's no television coverage of it, um, and the process itself is, is very secretive. So I wanted to make it invisible. And then the question came up of how do I represent the justices? Um, do I represent them at all? And I, you know, I auditioned Beanie Babies for the part. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea came up, they're represented by little rubber ducks that I line up in a row. I'm not sure what it means. Um, I have a lot of fun doing it. Um, these are all matched ducks. They're or... matched ducks. They're in a little row, and it kind of, it, 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 it will recall for people, you know, kind of going to the county fair and seeing the little shooting gallery with the ducks going by. Um, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure what it, what it means. I mean, in some ways, I'm the sitting duck in the situation. But there's something about the fact that they are the same. They're kind of uniform. Um, that I think is effective and people seem to really relate to. You seem a, a little ambivalent about being one of the NEA for uh, more a blessing than a curse or? Well, I think that um, I got, yes, all this publicity, but it was, um, I mean, people who say there's no such thing as bad publicity have, haven't really experienced it and experienced it when you become sort of a national joke. Um, and most arts organizations wanted to put as much distance between not just me, but the other artists that were red flag artists. Um, and, you know, it's not a very catchy title. It doesn't sound like a good band name. Um, and I, I, I know that um, some of the other artists have felt like, how do you deal with this note, right? Karen Finley made a piece about attack of the chocolate smeared woman. Because that's how she's seen, and she carries that baggage around, so you deal with it. And, and that was, you know, my attempt in this show. Like, I know maybe the way that you've heard about me is through this NEA4 case, and so let's just start there. Let's start the conversation there, as opposed to pretending that people can just forget about it. So where do you take the show next? I am going to be doing a long run of the show starting in October at the Woolly Mammoth Theater uh, in Washington, D.C. I'm very excited about it. I'll be running during the election, and I am going to invite all the Supreme Court justices and a, <laughs> um, a box seat for Senator Jesse Helms. I may have to build the box myself, but <laughs> maybe a padded box and I'll throw it. Uh, but I'm very excited about doing it, and I'm, I'm also touring to uh, colleges and uh, community centers around the country in the next year with the piece. So what do you think your odds are of actually having Sandra Day O'Connor come sit in the front row? Uh, well, that's, I don't know, I had um, Raquel Welch <laughs> came to see me at a <laughs> but, but you never portrayed Raquel Welch as a duck. I mean, I, a, a, exactly. Um, I, 
you know, I, I have the feeling actually that um, Justice Scalia has seen my work. Reading reading the decision, I thought that he had actually come and seen my work and Tim's work. So maybe he will come, and I would be curious. Maybe that'll be my next piece. <laughs> so you'll take this national colleges and, and universities, and do you, do you get a different reaction at all from college students than you do from whatever you would describe as your regular audience? Uh, the reaction varies wildly from, you know, I did did this at a small college in Michigan, Albion College, 300 people standing ovation. I did it in upstate New York and uh, at, at a certain critical moment in, in the show where I say all of the negative things that, that the writer said about us and that they're true, and half the audience got up and left. So it, it, it's inter it keeps it fresh because I'm not just running it in one place in the same old, uh, uh, it is a conversation with the audience. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today, Holly. Thank you, Ken. I'm Ken Paulson, back next week with another conversation about the First Amendment, the arts, and American culture. I hope you can join us then for Speaking Freely.